Good evening and welcome to Ridge Vineyard Spring 2014 Virtual Tasting. My name is David Amadia. I've had the pleasure of working at Ridge for the last nine years and I'll have the pleasure tonight of moderating uh, the tasting. We're coming to you tonight from the Old Tory Winery in the Santa Cruz Mountains at the Montebello Estate. Uh, we will be tasting with you tonight six wines and in tasting order these wines are as follows the 2012 Estate Chardonnay, the 2011 Estate Cabernet Sauvignon, the 2012 Buccagnani Ranch uh, Carignan, 2011 Carmichael Zinn, and the 2012 East Bench Zinfandel, and the 2012 Geyserville. Hopefully you've been able to print out a tasting mat and have all six wines out in front of you. So as a reminder, this is an interactive event and we really appreciate your questions and comments. So you can either send your comments through the chat function on live stream or you can send us an email at wine at ridgewine.com. Wine at ridgewine.com. All of them will be passed through to me and I'll share all of your questions and comments with the production team. So joining us today are three key members of our production team. So let's take a minute and introduce them to you. First, immediately to my left is Eric Bauer. Eric is the Vice President of Winemaking here at Montebello. And Eric's uh, been with us now in his 20th year. So yeah. congratulations yeah. on that, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, immediately to Eric's left is Paul Draper. Paul is our CEO and head winemaker and uh, has been with Ridge now 45 years. So exactly. welcome, Paul. Thank you for being with us. And to Paul's left is David Gates. Uh, David is our vice president in charge of vineyards. He's our farmer. Uh, David's got a BS and master's in uh, viticulture from UC Davis and has been with Ridge since 1989, 24 years. So we've got an experienced crew to talk about the wines tonight. So the first wine we'll be tasting with you is the 2012 Estate Chardonnay. It was made right here at Montebello. So I'm gonna ask Eric to kick off the discussion with that wine and obviously um, ask the other uh, production members to jump in at any time yeah. as well. So Eric? Yeah, well this comes right here from Montebello. It's uh, the 19 acres of Chardonnay that we have growing here. Um, the vines have some good age. I, I think the average age is about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all dry farm vines, low yields. And uh, the 12 vintage actually was a year the vines came back with some good growth uh, following two years of, of you know, low, low yields. Uh, they rebounded in 12 and gave us this incredible crop. Through summer, ripened nicely. Um, you know, we had a kind of mid-September to mid-October harvest as each block came in. Uh, the fruit went to the press, a whole cluster pressed, and uh, the juice was sent to barrel for each of the 12 different lots and underwent natural uh, fermentation, which uh, we like to do in the old cellar, so below ground, nice cool environment for a nice slow steady uh, primary fermentation, which in 12, it took about five months to complete. And then uh, as the, the wines went dry, then we worked the barrels, did lots of barrel lease stirring every two to three weeks and uh, did that through the, the natural malolactic fermentation which this year in 12, they actually finished really early ahead of schedule. So that gave us a chance to yeah. sit down early and taste and assess the lots and, and the quality. And in the, the 12 vintage, we were able to make both the Montebello Chardonnay and, um, uh, and the normal production here, the Estate Chardonnay, which is really the, the composition of, of the lots that really have good fruit focus, uh, elegance, oily texture. Uh, those lots were chosen to make this wine and, and they came together nicely. They settled out in tank and we were able to actually bottle in, um, I'm trying to remember, late October, I believe. Was it you know, right after the harvest, yeah. yeah. Really? So, um, yeah, and it just it has made a really beautiful quality uh, Chardonnay, which, you know, the style that we're going for in this wine is, is a Chardonnay that can be enjoyed in its youth does age pretty amazing like oh, the 97 yeah. you brought to uh we tasted to lunch, at, at today. lunch today yeah. 97 what basically the estate yeah the estate yeah and it was just oh you know, it was gorgeous great shape. yeah yeah so this has got good acid um and really vibrant flavor super, i mean it's super fresh wine yeah for sure and you, you were saying, Eric, it took uh, five months basically for the primary fermentation Which we to... Which like. I mean, we yeah. don't want the fermentation to go, you know, and 
three, four weeks. I mean, you know, a hot, fast fermentation like that can blow off a lot of the fruit esters and aroma, and you okay. can end up with a wine that doesn't have much definition. Okay. So we prefer really a nice, slow, steady fermentation that takes its time, keeps the wine very right. fresh. And the yeast, as they're undergoing fermentation in such a cool condition, they actually stress. Um, and, okay. and they can release a lot more of these really amazing essential oils to the wine. And in typically, uh, most vintages, there are a couple of parcels, sometimes the same ones, but not always, right. that are so structured mm -hmm. and that are not as fruit forward and really are going to take time to develop. And we set those aside as Montebello. It's right. a small quantity. And yeah, this and year, this vintage, uh, we made 800 cases of the Montebello selection. Okay which yeah. comes from some of the more stressed sites on, on the, the mountain. Does it, and how much more time in oak and how much more time in bottle will the Montebello get? Um, well, uh, in barrel, it was in barrel for another seven months okay. beyond the estate. And then uh, now that it's in bottle, it's gonna spend another year and a five half. months or yeah. yeah, year and a half before right. release. So here in the U United States, that wine will not be released for another year and a half almost. Yeah, September yeah. of yeah. 2015. Right, okay. And even then, it's gonna taste so young. Yeah. I mean, Montebello shards, I mean, once bottled and in, you know, in the market, I mean, they're really, they really start to open up when they're about seven to 10 years old. It's hard to get people to I know, to do that with <laughs> Chardonnay. Well, that's why Which you, we you drink, it. yeah, <laughs> we, we hold it. Eat extra year and yeah half. we hold it more time at the winery and then yeah. um, this is kind of the wine you know from this estate that you can drink young and, and this was one of the earliest bottlings of the yeah. estate yeah that, often that it means. goes out uh, at least three four five months mm -hmm. maybe yeah. not quite as long as right. the Montebello after it's been assembled yeah, and normally it's not bottled this year. in January February yeah and that, that was partially due to the fact that the secondary, the malolactic, yeah, went pretty everything little, moved along more really quickly. quickly. And that's not something you will force. You're just going to let nature take yeah, its course that's there? that's it, yeah. yeah. We couldn't force it if we wanted I know, no. Some, <laughs> I will take a fast malolactic fermentation <laughs> year over, yeah, some years where it's dragging out 16 months and right. it's still not finished. And, yeah. Yeah. That's tough. <laughs> yeah. That's a bit of agony, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, this is just a really uh, fantastic vintage of the Estate Shard. Okay. And it's looking like the 13 in the cellar right now is shaping up very similar. Yeah. Well, they were similar vintages, 12 and 13? Dry, dry years. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, below average rainfall. Um, probably the 13's got a little bit more concentration. Okay. Just the, the stress on the vines was a little more severe and it was the, next the berries were smaller, a little more concentrated okay. uh, fruit. Um, and really high acid. I mean, it's high acid here, but the 13s have oh, some impressive higher. acid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah. we'll talk about yeah, that yeah, here for next, now. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we move to the second wine, Eric? Uh, okay. And this is sort of the, the, the partner, the estate Cabernet yeah, so Sauvignon. This is the Cabernet coming off the uh, 2011 vintage. 11. So mm -hmm. the estate cab is coming from very select parcels on the mountain. Um, it's about, well, we've got. In total, among all the Bordeaux varieties grown here at Montebello, you know, anywhere between 34 and I think the number 40. 43 different lots or pickings that we do. Um, so every vintage, I mean, there's a core group of parcels that have always made the estate cab, you know, because of the structure, the tannin structure that comes from the fruit, right. um, where it produces a, a more fruit-forward wine, softer tannin structure, where the tannins are much more integrated. It, and you know those parcels, as they come in, they're brought to the fermenter, carefully fermented. Tannins have to be managed closely because we really don't want to turn those lots into Montebello, where you know their their tannin extraction is such that the wine you know it does can't handle its tannins as well. Right. You know, the tannins aren't coated; and they show a little bit firm. So we really back off on pump overs, we press early, whole press wine out so that those lots really come together nicely as a Cabernet that can make a wine that's enjoyed in its youth. Uh, then we have a group of parcels that always make Montebello, or right. virtually you know, 90% of the time. You know, those are the lots that come in with really good structure that you know, will support bottle aging for 50 plus years. And where the body can handle yeah, the Yeah, where, yeah, there's enough the fruit, yeah, fruit coating the tannins and 
you know, the wine is much more integrated. Okay. Uh, and then you have the parcels that really depend on the vintage, the growing season. They can kind of, some years make Montebello, some years they make Estate. And so those are the ones in the winery that you really have to do a tirage early on. So as the fruits in the fermenter, as we begin pumping over, we really taste carefully okay. and decide at that moment which way they're more likely to go. So that if they are heading towards the Estate cab, that we do treat them carefully so that yeah. they don't yeah. over extract. Well, I imagine that's where 20 years of experience comes into play when you're tasting well, wines. Tasting, tasting five times throughout and, the day, deciding right. each pump over. And, and then, of course, the crucial decision once it's ready to be drained off, you know, in the press as we fractionate, which fraction can come back. Because a press wine is yeah. really wonderfully complex wine. Sure. It's just if you've got a free run lot that's already kind of right at the limit of where it can handle tannin. Right. Press yeah, wine totally. added back could just push it over the line. So, and you have to remember that these yeah. these are young kind of raw wines. Right. Yeah. So sugar sugar hides tannin a lot. expression Very a lot. Well, yeah. Acid that's... brings out tannin expression. So you kind of have this yin yang that you're dealing with, trying to deal with that. And it's uh, it's it's actually not as easy as Eric makes it sound. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Yeah, there's a lot we do. There's a lot we do in the winery. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we try to get the tannin extraction to kind of coincide with the fermentation yeah. so okay. when it goes you know as it's getting drier and drier less of the sugars coating you can really see the true structure of the wine okay. so you know for a big period of the time that the wine you know that it's in the fermenter going right. we actually don't even do pump overs we do this thing of just circulating the juice under the cap aerating keeping the yeast fermenting and then right at the very end now that we're you know down at a close point of dryness we can do one last pump over at the end, and that's where we can sit there at the fermenter as it's being irrigated through the cap, tasting and be able to cut off uh, as we feel the, the wine really fills out. And when we so do the assemblage yeah. of the estate and of course the Montebello, mm -hmm. we also look to see if we were successful in cutting off in time. Mm -hmm. And typically there are always a couple, maybe five or six yeah. parcels where in that first assemblage of the estate or the Montebello or both, mm -hmm. we will say, okay, every time we try to add this parcel, it takes it over the line. And at that point, we will do a trial fining with fresh egg whites okay. to see um, if we can just change not so much bring the tannin down, doesn't seem to happen, right. but change the texture of the tannin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do that, our, uh, whether it's one egg or typically with early oh, fining, yeah. it's yeah. whole, it's a- It could be a dozen. It could be a <laughs> dozen, barrel. literally, because yeah. early yeah. on, uh, six eggs barely affects yeah. the wine. And um, then mm -hmm. we'll try it again in May in the second assemblage. Right. And almost always, those tannins have come into line and we can we can use the wine. It'll, it'll actually bring up the, the, the okay. assemblage. So we also blend in this wine Merlot, and in this sure. case there's a little bit of Franc and Petit Verdot, and oh, the Merlot right. really helps also round out the mid-palate. Okay. But when we do yeah. that, we do it blind. By so blind, yeah, and it's really whatever. It's Merlot for sure. We may yeah. say, God, that's got to be Petit Verdot, yeah. but we're not sure, and it's, does that wine taste better than without it? Does it without that parcel? So that's so when you're doing the in and out. The in yeah, and that's the, yeah. I mean yeah. what we do with Montebello assemblage and the same with the estate so, cab. Yeah. We taste through the lots without right. knowing whether it's cab, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Franc. And then it's a matter of if that lot is chosen and it comes into the blend and it's Merlot, it's how many barrels of that wine. Right. So it's not yeah. like we sit there and with graduated cylinders add yeah. and, and try to dial the percentages in just exactly. perfect. It's more of just <clears throat> how much we have of each of and the varieties. And the other thing, David, about this wine, it's the 2011, which Sorry, for yeah, much of California was such a difficult vintage. Yes. And here on Montebello, being above the fogs, mm -hmm. we got full ripeness. After that first rain, we had this beautiful, almost summer weather, warm temperatures, and in, in oh what, two or three weeks in October, oh, we did, fully ripened yeah, both the Montebello and the estate, yeah. and just made, we think, well, probably some of the best 2011 Cabernets that yeah. were made in California. Yeah. And this is one of the best, uh, we think, estates that we've made. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that, I mean, that's one of the questions that's come through right now, Paul, is you know, how did the 2011 vintage differ at Montebello versus the rest of Northern California? It was location. It yeah. Was, yeah. I mean, the elevation. The severe, <clears throat> as severe rains as the North Coast. Right. Okay. And also in this, in, during the summer when there were really these heavy, w much wetter fogs than usual yeah. all over California, but in the North Coast and, and down here below us, mm -hmm. our elevation at, you know, 1,400 to to 2650, 2670 yeah. feet, yeah. we were above much of that fog. Yeah. And so yeah. the yeah. Cabernet, which has a thick skin, and even the Merlot, mm -hmm. we didn't see the damage yeah, right. that There's other people no did. And in. also we picked, because we're aiming for the, our style of ripeness, which is in the 13% yeah. roughly range, we picked before that second rain. We weren't going for 15%, which yeah. we rarely could get anyway. And people, the majority of people waited for that, that ripe style and went through that second rain in November, all but a handful of people. And that was devastating to the quality. What, what do you remember about that vintage, David? How, how far in front of the, the second rain did we get, get the fruit in? Oh, the, the very last, the, yeah, the, I mean, the very last that. blocks were right at the end, but that's, that's more the rule than the exception here. Okay. Because yeah. <laughs> um, we're so late. The, yeah. the main thing I remember about 2011 up, up here at Montebello was um, a lot of weeds in the spring. It was a very yeah. wet year, the wet spring. And, um, and so we had, we had to do everything we could to um, keep those weeds from overtaking the, the vines. We the tractors oh, constantly yeah. yes, it knocking was, weeds down. Yeah. And they it was almost like right every back. weekend it would rain, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but. I think the last of the rains came in like July. Yes, yes. Just right around bloom, so we yeah, had a little amazing. bit of shatter in Merlot. Yes, especially and, Merlot yeah. was, was more affected than Cabernet yeah. in, in the 11. So the 11 is not a Merlot year in the mm -hmm. Montebello, for example. Yes. Yeah, it's only yeah. 8%. Yeah. And here it's, I think, 14%. But interestingly, a cool vintage 2011, we're looking at 13 degrees alcohol yeah. here in this state. Well, there was that late season heat. So after yeah. that early October rain, then we had just three Beautiful weeks heat. of 85 degree I weather. Mean, and that's really I what matters the most, I if, think, with quality. If, if the rest of yeah. California and Cabernet were willing to make a 13 percent, you know, style wine, they would have had a really quite nice, excellent vintage. Yeah. And uh, instead, it was really unfortunate. Yeah. Well, good, yeah. good. So why don't we move forward to our third wine, which is uh, the 2012 uh, Kerrignan from the Bucagnani Ranch. And, and David, can I ask you to, to, to speak to this wine? Sure, okay. David, thanks. Okay. So the Bucagnani Ranch Kerrignan comes from Stan Bucagnani's D&D &D Ranch, and it is located in Alexander Valley on Dutcher Creek Road, up close to the town of, of uh, Cloverdale. So it's in the north, northern end of the Alexander Valley, on the, on the warm side, and um, Carignan loves that. And these are beautiful old vines planted in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and the last little parcel in the 50s from um, uh, Stan's grandfather, his uncle, and his dad um, planted these out. So was his uncle the one in the 40s then? Uh, no, that was his, um, yes. Yes. Okay. His uncle and his dad okay. uh, were both, were both farming it. Yes. Okay. And uh, Stan has been um, taking care of this ranch for the last, I believe, 25 or 26 years. And um, this, we've been making this wine since 1999. And okay. very happy to have it. It's, it, it's a great spot for Carignan. And um, mainly because the... The heat keeps the Carignan in check a little bit because right. it's a big vine. And then um, it's up on a little bit of a ridge. It's at the very head of Borelli Creek. And there's always wind that's going in between. There's the Dutcher Creek Road is kind of a connector from the upper end of Dry Creek Valley to the upper end of Alexander Valley. And wind follows that road quite a bit. And so that, um, that also helps put some stress on the vine. So very small berries with this Carignan. And unlike our um, Cabernet Merlot grapes here at Montebello, the, the Carignan that we um, grow and, and produce wine from um, is fully crushed. At, on the fermenter, so because um, it doesn't have the same amount of tannin yeah, as as bigger, Cabernet, juicier berry. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. And these are typically um, a lot shorter fermentations. Um, you know, anywhere from five to seven days okay. on the skins, and then you, you get them off. Um, this was made at Litton Springs with John only um, taking care of it, and 
since um, oh, it's been it's been about five years now that we've kind of helped Stan um, with his with the picking of these grapes. So we go in over usually two or three days to pick off. He's got a little bit of zin and then a lot of Carignan in the ranch. So we picked that ranch out over about three days. Before that, it was Stan with his crew of, um, usually he'd have about 10 guys, and, and it was almost, you could set your watch to him at 10 o'clock in the, in the morning. He'd come in with one load of grapes, about five and a half tons, and then at, at about 1.30 in the afternoon, he'd come back with the second load, and he would do that over the course of a week or so um, to, to bring in all the grapes, and um, yeah, it's, it's it's fun. I kind of miss that because you, I swear you could set the watch to, to Stan. But on the other hand, yeah. now we can get ideal yes. ripeness yeah. yes, instead. With Stan, it was you know starting out and then getting yeah, riper. The, yeah, you know. the last Every loads were coming. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and David, you mentioned that it's uh, on this edge of Alexander Valley. Yes, and that's Alexander Valley Appalachian, right. yeah. not the valley. The valley. Okay. Ends it really it goes up against the hills at Geyserville, mm -hmm. and and Stan is way toward yeah. the coast up on on the hills, yeah. and so it's not. I mean, just because it's called Alexander Valley, it's not the valley. It's it's, no, it's up on, it's up on the hills. Yeah, yeah. And you'll, you'll see on the label we say hillside hillside yeah. Carignan. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it is. <laughs> and <laughs> also, it's near. It's it's the climate, and it's near the northern end of Dry Creek, Absolutely. and the and the climate is much more like that. Mm -hmm. So it really is warmer. Mm -hmm. How big a block of Carignan is it there at the ranch? He's got about 25 acres total, and of that, about 18 is Carignan. And, and what what was their thinking back when they planted this uh, to plant that much Carignan? You know, they they um, the oldest vines are are almost pure Carignan. Mm -hmm. Now there are some, of course. You know, we talk about mixed vineyards yeah. quite a bit. And the oldest ones have a few um, white vines in, in amongst them, and a, every now and then a Zinfandel, on the, and that's the very front Carignan that we call it. And then um, during, and that was during Prohibition, so okay. they knew what was growing, you know, what would do well in that. And what, what they wanted was not necessarily a, a specific variety, but something that could handle the heat okay. and the acid. And then in the early 30s, they planted Zinfandel block, and those are, the, they're more, a little bit more mixed as well. They're still okay. about 98% Zinfandel. In, so, um, but then they have a lot of other varieties in amongst them anyway, okay. including Carignan and some a little bit of Petite Syrah, so some really old Petite Syrah mm -hmm. vines. And uh, but you know they they sold to Gallo for years and years sure. and years, and probably before Gallo bought Fry Brothers, they were selling to Fry Brothers. Okay, yeah, and it's just one of the most beautiful vineyards. Yes. The, the yeah. individual vines because it's head trained. Yeah. So there's no trellis, and they are just beautiful. And, and what he tills every, everything, right? Yes, and yes. no cover crops. So <laughs> consequently, it's just immaculate. It's, yeah. it's really beautiful. Nice stony soil. Uh, I mean, the vines are tall, too. I mean, it's like walking in an orchard. I mean, Carignan yeah, grows not really, quite. not quite, but you know, <laughs> pretty <laughs> tall yeah. vines. That's a big, yeah. big, big plant. Yeah. yeah. Paul, here's a question that you might be able to field. It's, um, what, you know, what prompted Ridge to start making Rhone wines as opposed to Cabernet or Zinfandel? Okay, um, basically, I'll focus on Carignan, okay. um, or as the, as the old California growers call it, Carignan. Okay. <laughs> and so um, the reason was that, that because our old Geyserville, old Lytton Springs, and basically any of our old vineyards, all, almost all, are mixed plantings, these field blends that were this really intelligent thing, the old, the old growers in the 19th century uh, you know, the 1890s did yeah. to give Carignan giving acid, a Petit Syrah giving depth of color and tannin, uh, all of them, bo both those giving a, a more complex flavor to the Zinfandel. Um, we wanted to show everybody, because we were making in those days, and of course still do, a Petit Syrah, to show them what was in those Zinfandels. What did, what did the individual things like Petit Syrah taste like? And in this case, the Carignan. Okay. And so that's what got us started to keep a little bit or find a vineyard like Stan's mm -hmm. where he's got old vine Carignan. And we could show people, okay, this is one of the elements that goes into the Geyserville, for Field example. Field blend, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good. 
And David, do you want to uh, take a moment also while we're talking about older vines to talk about the Historic Vineyard Society and what that is and what uh, what your role and Ridge's role in that is? Yeah, the Historic Vineyard Society is a kind of ad, ad hoc nonprofit started up a few years ago now um, by by um, people like, like Ridge that we're interested in trying to document and hopefully preserve old vineyards. So the first thing we had to struggle with was what, what is an old vineyard? There's no definition, no legal term. What is old? What is an old vine? So we picked up the word historic because we're looking at, at uh, not trying to say old and not, not say ancient vines or anything. Uh, but they, there is history there. And, and then we, we decided that um, 50 years would be a good working term for something that is outlived um, usually two generations of, of owners, so it's it's made good enough wine to stay in the ground over a, a one or two generation turnovers. And then the other thing is that's about between two and three lifespans, average lifespans of a vineyard in California. It's currently now less than about 17 years. Uh, Which means that the ground, people you know, take vineyards out. In yeah. 17 to 25 years. In 17 to 25 years. years. So a 50 yeah. year old vineyard is giving different character Absolutely. to, a, to a, a wine than 17 or 20 year old. Absolutely, and the, and the neat thing is uh, the stories of the people that have taken taken on these vines and and taken them over, and that's those stories come from the owners, they, it comes from the, the caretakers that are farming them, and it comes from the wineries that choose to um, present them to consumers that might want to buy it. So the, the one of the main goals besides documenting old um, vineyards throughout the state is to um, try to kind of work with the, the legislature to see if there's a way that we can help protect them. Okay. Maybe maybe make them historic landmarks or something like that. But that's still a very big work in progress. So uh, Good yeah. luck with that. Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, of all the old vineyards, historic vineyards you've found, um, Zinfandel or mixed Zinfandel vineyards that are predominantly Zinfandel or more than half Zinfandel. What percentage of all the old vines do they represent? Uh, 90 plus. 90 plus. So yes. the grape that was that made such fine wine from back in the 1890s on or, uh, that it could not be taken out even during prohibition right. when you when you couldn't make wine. Um, Zinfandel, 90 percent, that was what was saved. And, you know Cabernet was not saved. No. Uh, we didn't even have Chardonnay in those days so on. Zinfandel was was the one that was so prized they they kept it. Yeah. So that's interesting perspective, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, a question about pulling out of vines that's come through, David. Why would a winery? Why would a vineyard owner pull out vines at seventeen or twenty years of age? Oh, it's 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 all about economics. Um, some and sometimes they decline because they were put on the wrong rootstock, or there's a new disease that is has hit the vines and they're not no longer economically viable. A, a great example of that is um, uh, Petit Syrah versus Cabernet in Napa Valley. Um, Petit Syrah gets a very high price in Napa Valley and, and that used to be up until the 70s was the um, black grape of the, with the highest acreage, the most tonnage was Petit Syrah, much more than Cabernet. Um, and even despite that high price, you know, uh, with for Petit Syrah, Cabernet gets a better price, and um, has more buyers for it, and you can get better tons per acre on Cabernet than you can on Petit Syrah, and there's there's just just looking at it objectively, there's no reason to plant Petit Syrah in Napa Valley, and or to keep an old Petit Syrah vineyard in the ground in Napa Valley, it's it's for the cost of land and try to try to get a return on your investment. You need to plant it to Cabernet and pump up the yields and and sell it for what is yeah. One ton? A Napa Cab going for I well, mean, you know, know, five to seven thousand a ton. No, higher. Even higher, higher yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the average is, is around ten grand. Oh, it's and wow. yeah, no, it's insane. And it's, so the economics, yeah. basically, the reason to tear them out, you started it's with economics. it, yeah. is that is that after twenty years, you may not be getting as much. You can't push it as high in terms of getting high yields and therefore a lot of tons. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you can uh, with the younger vines. So you take it out, plant younger vines, and they will give you more crop. More crop. Yeah. And, and also so it's not quality high. driven though. Oh, no, no it isn't. And, and okay. there's, also, there's also, the more you push a vine when it's young, the, lo the less, less long it will live. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's almost, I wouldn't say that there's only so many tons the grapevine can give you in its life, so you can either get them all out in a short period of time or, or spread them out later, but it's, it's almost that way. Um, so if it, you overwork it, yes. somebody, it's, yeah. it's yes. not going to live as long. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. All right. So why don't we move forward and look at our fourth wine, Eric, which the, is the uh, uh, 11 Carmichael's yeah. Infidel. So, yeah, from the cool growing season mm -hmm. of the 11 vintage. And so the Car Carmichael Ranch is, is a uh, connection to uh, Geyserville, but it's a section of the, the vineyard that's in a, a really dense clay soil. Okay. You know, it runs out. I and mean, the Geyserville is made up of the parcels that are, are on this beautiful alluvial soil. And yet these blocks of really nice old Zinfandel vines fall in this really heavy clay section of the ranch and makes a very different wine, a uh, very soft texture, different acidity. You know, the Geyserville is where we have really good firm acid, but yet from this section here, you know, it's, it's more typical Zinfandel, which is a higher pH. You know, it makes a very soft wine and beautiful fruit and complexity there. And now in the 11 vintage being this nice long growing season, um, you know, we picked right before the rains and got the fruit off and it came in with moderate ripeness. So it's made a, a beautiful zen at four, the low 14% alcohol yeah. range. And uh, again, just has this amazing fruit. Uh, there's some field blend varieties in there as well. So zin, dominant zen, but then a little bit of Carignan and Petit Syrah. Okay. And just looking at the glass, having swirled it, uh, the, the, the glycerin, the richness oh, yeah. on, on the side, it really, it's just for an 11 to be yeah. this, this full, rich, and, yeah. and yet not to be you know, so tannic or so, yeah. have so much acid that you can't approach it. Beautiful, it's young, beautiful wide. Yeah. And we've been making the Carmichael since 2004, you know, when we carved out those parcels. And um, it's just made, I mean, over the last, you know, vintages, that uh, just a nice early drinking Zinfandel. Okay. And how does the character of a Zinfandel vary if it's grown in clay soil versus maybe more well-drained rocky soil? Well, you get a different mineral expression. I mean, Zinfandel grown in clay, I mean, it will definitely have an impact on the texture of the wine. It definitely lends this creamy texture. You get more clay minerals. Uh, it's always higher on the pH scale. So less and it's acidic. Hold, and what, more water in the, in the clay soil. Yeah, clay's, yeah. clay's tough because it, it holds more water than gravel or loam, but less of that water is available to the vines. So it's yeah. either too wet or too dry. Yeah, so it's so either the vines, and vines really don't stressed like out too or wet. Not. Yeah, they don't yeah. like too wet. And then yeah. when it's too dry, they just kind of slow down. So, yeah. It's, yeah, it's tough, so in the well drained soil of Geyserville, you, you get a lot more water stress going on the vines. Um, of course, they're also pick, picking up different minerals. Um, and you just end up with a more concentrated wine. I think that you get deeper roots in, yeah. in, the, in, the, Absolutely. in the gravel of Geyserville than you do in the clay yes. of, yeah. of Carmichael. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we really haven't uh, talked much about the current drought conditions here in California and how that's impacting um, mm -hmm. the harvest or the upcoming harvest. So if somebody really wants to know, you know, how are the vines progressing this year given the drought? And, yeah, yeah, and I'm, just, a lot, I'm a lot more happy now than I was two weeks ago because yeah. we've actually had quite a bit of rain. Well, quite a bit, David. Name, yeah, say how many inches. Well, so we went, we went here at Montebello, we went from about three and a half inches, now we're up to 11 inches. And our yeah. usual normal, um, whatever that means, is 30 to 35 inches per year. So we're not by any means out of the woods yet, but it's a lot better than we were looking at. So, and all of this rain, or most of those inches of rain that we've had received recently is pretty much available to the vines. The weeds are taking a little bit, but we're actively doing our cultivation now. And so that will really help the vines. They were so dry this winter when we were pruning in January and February. Um, and in Sonoma, we're a little bit better off, but we're about 17 or 18 inches um, up at Lytton Springs in Geyserville. But we usually get 35 or 40 inches there. So we're not out of the woods yet by any means, but like I say, I feel a lot better now. Yeah, better today. shape than in 13. 13, I mean, we had the 20 inches of rain, but it was all in December. Yes. So once the season was yes. underway, yeah. the ground was severely it was, dry. It was very dry in 13. All the way through summer. <clears throat> yes. Well, well most then, people yeah. know that, you know, California, the time when it's green is the winter. Yes. yes. Yeah. It hasn't been green. And now, just, just now, in the last few weeks, yeah. 
with a little bit of water, finally California is green. And, you know, it's, it, it, we're hoping it's going to get us through August and September right. as the water that we're getting now gradually drops, we hope not below the root system. Yeah. But that's when we get water stress. Yeah. I and mean, this is not helping us um, with the drought because all of this water is just in the topsoil. It's not really going down into replenish the aquifers or anything. And the snowpack is still, which you know California relives, relies on, is still very low. Yes. But um, it's better than nothing. And what are you doing viticulturally right now, David, to sort of mitigate or to, to deal with the drought conditions? Are you doing things differently in the vineyard than yeah, in a normal so, year? Well, yeah, a little bit. It's the timing is, is what's different. So in a wet year, we delay our, our mowing as long as possible and our cultivation weed control to try to let the weeds uh, sap some of the vigor from the vines. In a dry year like this year and last year, um, we cultivate as early as possible and so that we eliminate as much competition with the vines um, as we can, so that they get all that water, they get all the nutrients. So going into this year, if let's say we don't get much more rainfall than we have now, mm -hmm. how does that impact the type of crop load that you might want to carry in this type of year? Yeah, so for sure we will be um, watching crop levels. Um, we pruned a little bit harder this year because it was so dry, so we'll get a little bit less yield anyway. And then if, it, if um, the weather, isn't cooperating with us so we don't get much more rain then we will probably be dropping more crop than we usually do so yeah, yeah. and the other oh. thing david is, yes, that, yeah. is that as most people know we don't irrigate that is the only vines we, do, we don't have any reservoirs we're up on yeah. top of a mountain and so the only vines that get any irrigation are young vines and most people know that in california whether you plant a rose bush or a, a vine if you don't water it through the the first God, five summers at least until the roots are down. Right. Uh, it's it's it will it will die that summer, mm -hmm. and so we have to drip irrigate the young vines. But once we're out there at at five ten years, we can stop entirely. And <clears throat> the vines here have have not been irrigated since they were that age. So uh, don't take this wrong, Paul, but you're one of the few people who was making wine in the 70s when we had our last big drought. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what do, you, what do you remember about those years and what was the character of the wines that came out of those vintages? Well, it, it was really 76, 77. Right. And, and it was, it was uh, serious. And, and, uh, and I'm shocked that the state or the local counties have not put in the uh, what the rules on how much water right. a, an individual family or certainly a, can use right. um, that were put in yeah. back in, in 76, 77. Uh, and I don't quite know why, and I think it's really a mistake. But in any case, um, it weakened the vines. And we really saw um, part of it was that our timing was nowhere near. We didn't have David yet. Uh, <laughs> our timing wasn't as good. Right. On what, and looking for and controlling mildew and so on. Right. And so in, um, in 78, but then 79 and 80, but 79, the w vines were weak enough that we really saw uh, damage and low yields and problems that mm -hmm. it took a, a, a year or two to come back from that drought because th there was so little water, the vines were literally weakened. And up here, we couldn't irrigate. Right. So, I mean, we didn't have the water. So these were in the years after the drought ended, the, it, the effects of it sort of lingered on. Yeah, we, yeah. we declassified the 79 Montebello. We didn't make a Montebello. We made a couple of barrels yeah. from the upper vineyard because my daughter was born that year. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. and, and th that was the, some of the only vines that really were in balance. And, and 80, luckily, I just had 80 the other day from a really good seller and was amazed that it, was, it showed quite beautifully because mm -hmm. we always said 80 was not one of the finest vintages. It was good, but I was just astounded. We, we are so critical of our own vintages <laughs> that, you know, we say, oh, that was a great vintage. That was good, but not good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, 80 actually is, is, is showing okay. So th this is a question, David, from the barn about the warm January that we had yes. and uh, the early bloom. Is, is that a, was that a concern or is that a concern? Um, the, the main problem with January was, well, that the warmth wasn't necessarily good, but it was so dry. That was the biggest problem. We, by, in January, we really hadn't had significant rain and since the, the June before and really good rains from December of 2012. So the soil was 
pretty much bone dry. The vines were then they know that they're dormant, but they're still you know they're still alive. So you prune pruning the vines in January. The weight um, pruning weight was probably half of what it should be because there was just no moisture in them. Okay. So that's tough, and you can get buds to dry out from that. Um, it, it's just what what vines do in response. Um, the the warmth of January didn't didn't necessarily make us bud uh, have bud break any earlier, and I would say our bud break was a little bit early this year. But it's amazing how uniform it was when it actually happened. So it was after that. So the ground was dry. Um, January and February got nice and warm, and then the last little bits of rain that we had the end of February, that was like almost almost like a false awakening so they sucked that water up quickly and then they started to push and okay. you know late mm. late february early march that's not atypical for us to start okay. bud break. And what's when, amazing is it across the state and that's one of the great things right? was the rains the they were not they were well they were significant in that we mm. had nothing but they were very gentle mm -hmm. and so we didn't get the runoff and the soil was so dry it just took all that so water dead. we didn't lose it to the San Francisco Bay and the ocean, we, we actually kept it. Yeah, bad for the fish, good for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to our fifth wine, if we can, which is the 2012 East Bench. Uh, David, can I ask you to t comment on this, 100% Zinfandel? Yeah. Uh, so this comes from Dry Creek. Um, it's on the east side of the, the Dry Creek Valley, and it's up on Benchland, so that's kind of where the name comes from. It's adjacent to our Lytton Springs property, or Lytton West property, and we have this on a, on a lease um, ever since uh, 2000 when we planted the first of the seven blocks um, on, on the property. And this, this, um, these vines are big and vigorous. It was a, a block that had been fallowed sometime. We, we assume that it was planted during Prohibition because it's never had trees on it. Um, at least it didn't for the last 100 years, I would say. And um, there's a nice old vineyard just on the other side, another parcel just north of there, or south of there. Um, so it makes sense that it had been planted, but sometime during after Prohibition, the vines had died and not had not been replanted. Instead, um, the, the owners had run horses and goats and cattle on it and, um, and just use it as a paddock, as a pasture. And as a consequence, the soil is well rested and the vines are very vigorous. So this is one of the, this is almost like the, um, the youngest vines on the Witten Ranch where we um, get really good yields even with dropping half the crop on the ground. So, um, and it, it, because it's up on the bench, it's fast drying soil. Um, the, the fruits tends to ripen on the early side so um, we can get it in. It's one of the first blocks that, to be picked. And we have four different uh, field selections of Zin that, that are in here, our favorites, that, that we are now um, working through the um, clean program at UC Davis, Foundation Plant Services, to be able to get absolutely clean wood from these selections that are now clones that we will then um, plant out in our, in our next blocks. So somebody's paying attention because they're asking a challenging question here. Given your comments about the merits of mixed blocks, wh why was East, East Bench planted purely to Zinfandel? Initially, initially, um, uh, we 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 weren't sure one that we would be keeping it, making it as a separate wine, right. and um, and Zinfandel was what we really wanted to to see an increase in the quantity of Zinfandel we had. And um, yet at Paso, Paso Road Place at Benny Ducey's Vineyard, it's virtually 100% right. Zinfandel and makes its own style. And so many people have asked us, okay, you guys are big proponents, just like this yeah. question, of these old mixed vineyards. Um, we also wanted to show in the immediate area of Lytton Springs and not far from Geyserville, what 100% Zinfandel can do. And I think the answer is it's a beautiful, complex wine in its own right, but subtly different from, uh, from Lytton Springs itself, where you see the mix of, of, old, of, of other varietals. So um, it's, it's that great contrast is yeah. to say to people, okay, which do you prefer? Here is, uh, here is pure Zinfandel, here is um, the old blend, and is one more complex? We're, we're just beginning to see how well this will age out. Uh, we haven't made it that long, no. and so it's, 
Whereas Geyserville, I mean, we can go back 46 years and, and look at uh, a Ridge Zinfandel from Geyserville. Right. And here it's, it's still, what, less than yeah. 10 or just mm -hmm. 10? Mm -hmm. Well, it is, it is like a that. tremendous point of difference to be able to have a 100% Zen and Dry Creek right next to Lytton and Geyserville right. to see what the differences are. It's, it's like showing the Carignan. Yeah. Okay, to answer, you know, yeah. or to show people what we're trying to do and what it's all about, here is a great single vineyard or single varietal Zinfandel. Yeah, and if I could be a little more pragmatic too, um, <laughs> this is a lease, so we don't own this land. Um, the, right. the owner had a say in what went in the ground, oh. so that made that was part of it. As that well. is being pragmatic, David. Yes, yeah. it is. But, yeah. uh, Reminding <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, also the reality is, as we're doing new plantings at Lytton Springs and Geyserville yes. now, we yeah. are we emulating are our own the own estates making these field blends. Yeah. And having yeah. great success with them, especially at Geyserville where we did it the first time. And yeah, the first time was 2000. Yeah. The first, and that's when we planted, um, started East Bench was mm -hmm. 2000, 2001. So at Fredson Ranch. The, the block two, the mix, the new patch was new planted patch, in yeah. 2000. So that was our first dipping the toe in the water. Yeah. And what was the amazing result, of yeah. course, was that when we plant a, uh, a typical uh, new Zinfandel uh, vineyard or replant an old whatever it was, whatever varietal was there, um, as you mentioned at Geyserville, it took 10 years and dropping 50% of the crop before at Whitten Ranch at Geyserville, uh, in blind tasting, that wine could make the Geyserville, could make the assemblage. And um, we, we, went, we as soon as we saw some of the earliest crops off of the new patch, this, this, this field blend, it started to go in, blind tasted. Right. And we realized that by, by planting the way the, the old guys did, that wine is so much more complex, uh, starting right in the early years whereas straight Zinfandel takes more time. Right. So somebody's asking, uh, Paul, maybe you can feel this, because you've been making and Zinfandel and been a proponent of Zinfandel for so long. Where do you think it is now in terms of its popularity within the U.S.? Is it gaining? Is it neutral? Where, where is Zinfandel today? Well, it, it's a good question. I, I think, and David, you're, you're part of this, yeah. and that is that, um, well, I'll, I'll go way back to the 70s mm -hmm. when, um, Zinfandel really first hit the, not so much Ridge, well, Ridge Zinfandels too, yeah. hit the national market. And the people that were making, making it um, suddenly had a really good market developing. And uh, so everybody stepped in who had Zinfandel, kept it separate finally, and put it out there in the market. Okay. But they put it out there in the market at a very, very ripe style right. in a time when the market was used to much more moderate um, extraction and, and certainly ripeness. And it just, uh, it, it just lost all of its reputation. And yet, we were selling more Zinfandel than ever because our style was more moderate. Um, it really, uh, it's, it's hard for me to say except that Ridge Zinfandel here and overseas, I mean, the UK, for example, oh, sure. incredible, we cannot supply uh, this market or the UK, and we have no intention of trying. That is, we're going to stay the same size we are, right. but the demand for, we think, fine Zinfandel is, we see, is greater than ever. Now, how do other people feel, and do you have a feeling about, about the popularity of all Zinfandel? Well, I, I think it is popular in growing slowly. It's not gigantic growth, but I think what's encouraging in my mind is the number of new younger producers that are focused on quality mm -hmm. Zinfandel and on older vines that are coming in and making really interesting wine. So I think that's really hopeful for the future that, that there, 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 there are these people committed to Zinfandel and I think that's really positive. I had dinner last night at uh, Cafe Panisse at Chez Panisse in Berkeley mm -hmm. and with some old friends and I brought a bottle of the 97 Lytton Springs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, the sommelier decanted it just before we served it. And I mean, f we know 97 for us uh, was a great vintage. And for a lot of people, their 97s in Cab or Zin are not aging that well. Well, here was this Zinfandel, not even a Cabernet. And from the first moment, uh, I mean, we talked about it in terms of, my God, anybody who 
taste this wine, smells this aroma, taste this wine, uh, would say this is one of the great varietals of the world. It, it was right through an hour and a half long dinner. It was just magnificent, having been decanted. And uh, so we know, and I think many of our own customers know, that uh, even as young wine, but definitely with age, uh, it, it is one of the great varietals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's terrific. So um, I think we should move forward to our last wine, Eric, which yeah, is, well, is the 2012 Geyserville. So Serious yeah, Zinfandels here. <laughs> Oh the, yeah, the 12 Geyserville. I mean, it's it's from the great vintage, um, perfect weather, uh, beginning of drought year here in uh, California, but with good carryover water resources from the uh, 10 and 11 growing seasons. So the vines actually managed quite well through uh, summer. Yields were phenomenal having uh, been short in 2010 and 11. The vines had the energy and they set a very good crop and um, gave us this amazing fruit. I think most of the harvest was towards mid-September into mid-October. So a little bit on the later side, um, which coincided with picking here at Montebello. So we were actually at the winery juggling Cabernet coming in and the Geyserville fruit. But it all worked out. Um, the, the fermentations were beautiful, um, natural yeast fermentations that were about seven to eight days. Mm -hmm. And during that time, um, Lots of pump over tasting, but you know it ended up being a, a quite a structured Geyserville. It is, yeah. yeah. Particularly from you know somewhat of a warmer vintage, it still has this oh, great structure and a lot of dark fruit to it. Yeah, and good acid. Yeah, and Zimf uh, yeah. well, you've you've mentioned it, but um, Geyserville always has this very firm acid, and I mean it's second only to Montebello in terms yeah, of, yeah. of firm acid. And one thing with, that we these wines that we're having. Um, that we have in front of us, the red wines, are all double decanted. And we think Geyserville, this, mm -hmm. this 12 Geyserville is a perfect example of why with young wines, red wines, mm -hmm. you should double decant. Uh, it really opens them up that if you just open a bottle of the 12 Geyserville now, it's so young that it is really tight. But just by pouring it into a decanter, and then back, if you have a steady hand, into yeah. the bottle, if not a small funnel. Okay. Uh, it's just going to bring it up and to show it the way we're seeing it today. Yeah. And maybe uh, a number of the people tasting with us uh, didn't double the can, and they're going to have a tighter wine than we do. Right. So we really believe in that. And, and then as a wine ages, at, a, at some point, whether it's eight years, 10 years, you move back to single decanting. Mm -hmm. And decanting, in both cases, just before you're going to have the wine, okay. because you don't want to lose any of that initial um, aroma and, and fruit. So Eric, we have some questions about the Geyserville in particular, about yeah. the 12 vintage, maybe how it compares to some other recent vintages, and also Let's maybe see. some of your favorite vintages maybe uh, of Geyserville in the last, rich. no, just oh, oh, but like okay. in the last decade or so, not last, going too far. Well, I like the 2001. I mean, this would be mm. kind of in that direction. Okay. Um, a real structured, more European style. I mean, it's, it's a, definitely a, a firmer Geyserville, which does take some time. So, I mean, if you open the 2001 today, I mean, it's just amazing okay. wine. So it's just going to require some patience. Okay. Um, but I also like the 2005. I like uh, the <laughs> 2007. Okay. You know, the years where there's a lot of field blend influence, the Carignan, the Petit Syrah. So when some of the other varieties make it into the blend in higher yeah. higher percentages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And to, so 2005, that was a, a larger crop, but a cooler vintage, right? It was, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a nice summer, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really. Yeah. I mean, Long growing season. For Zinfandel, what I mean, really matters is just that weather leading into harvest. Okay. So in 12, I mean, we did have some August fog. That kind of slowed yeah, the vines things. down. Thank God. I mean, you get those, those yeah. growing seasons where you have a blast of heat, and suddenly the grapes take off and you have to step in very fast right. and pick and you know do so to, to control the ripening. Sure. But those wines don't always quite fill out with, with body and structure. And so the real ideal is for Zen to come in at a nice slow pace where you've got the weather kind of nice and mild. And we saw that in 12. We did, yeah. yeah. And we had a little bit of burst of heat, but it was really right in the days of the harvest, yeah. which really helped with the flavor development. Yeah. And but one nice thing to mm -hmm. say is, is that 
you know, 11 may have been problematic for a lot of people because of the, of the rain and the fogs and just the difficulties. 12 for virtually everyone was just a beautiful California vintage right. across the board and 13 again maybe even better for a lot of people just both of them great vintages so yeah. California as a state has had in a row in it's a time when too. Europe is suffering yeah, exactly. from lesser vintages well we were California due for a good vintage we, after we were after 10 and 11, 10 and 11 yeah. with its, with its, yeah. with its yeah. difficulties but it but really for all of California uh, these last two vintages have just been yeah. great. I think as a wine, we're feeling very good that we have two solid vintages in the house that we're going ready to release to the public over the next two years. And yeah. good for consumers yeah. that they're going to have good wines yeah. to drink over the next two to three years as well from, from California and from Ridge. So that's, that's certainly good news. And hopefully the yeah. drought won't have too big an impact and we can have a good 14 as well, right? It should be. Yeah. And with a, with a, very, <laughs> a very wet winter, we hope, this yeah. next year oh, to yes. replace yeah. the aquifer. As long as it starts in November, December. Not, not, yeah. a, not <laughs> in <laughs> September. Not in September. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, if we're putting in orders, you might as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, um, I'd really like to thank David, Paul, and Eric for joining us tonight and for, uh, for their uh, enthusiasm and for their comments. And uh, thank you to our audience for joining us for the tasting this evening. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the fall when we do our fall virtual tasting. Uh, until then, um, cheers and good yeah. night.